even on your cell phones or your laptops, whatever you got, turn to Acts 18. Acts 18. As we continue, uh, the Lord is just a blessing and continues. Don't have the um, continues to lead us and direct us in following the red letter words in the Bible, the words of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and uh, we just continue to do it chronologically. And it's amazing to me again how. The words fit what we need in the church as the Lord is leading it in this direction. So please join me uh, as we look at the words from, from our Lord to Paul in Acts 18 and 1. If you would stand with us as we read these verses and honor of reading the Word of God. And you, as you read along in yours or you can read it overhead. It says, after these things, Paul departed from Athens and went to Corinth. Now notice that's important. From Athens to Corinth. And he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born of Pontus, who had recently came from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome. And he came to them. So because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked. For by occupation they were tent makers. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath, and persuaded both Jews and Greek. Then Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia. Paul was compelled by the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. And when they opposed him and blasphemed, he shook his garments and said to them, Your blood be upon your heads. I am clean. From now on I will go to the Gentiles. And he departed from there and entered the house of a certain man named Jutas, and one who worshipped God, whose house was next door to the synagogue. Then Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed, that's important, I just love that. The ruler of the synagogue believed on the Lord with all his household, and many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. Now... The Lord spoke to Paul in the night vision. These are your red letter words. Do not be afraid, but speak and do not keep silent. For I am with you and no one will attack you to hurt you. For I have many people in this city. And he continued there a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. Lord, thank you for the reading of your word. Thank you for the opportunity to serve you and your people. Lord, we pray that you help each one of us open our ears, our hearts, and our minds and receive what you have for us today, that you are glorified in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Has God ever spoken to you? If not audibly, maybe through circumstances, uh, maybe through someone else, maybe through a book you were reading, maybe through the scriptures. He spoke to your heart. Perhaps it was so real, it was like it was an audible voice and God just speaking to, real to you. As we read here, Paul heard him speak to him and this you can be assured of, it was an unforgettable experience and it came to him and a moment of great trial and uncertainty in his life. And for Paul, it was much needed word. It's also a much needed word for us today as well. It's what, got, what Paul heard from the Lord. Now, I want you to notice, first of all, in that first part of verse uh, 9, Acts 18, 9, the Lord gave Paul exhortation. It says, now the Lord spoke to Paul in a night vision and said, do not be afraid. But speak and do not keep silent. You see, it was almost a rebuke to Paul, wasn't it? He said to him, do not be afraid. Stop being afraid, basically. Stop, because he was being afraid. Keep on speaking and do not be silent. We like to think of Paul, if you studied his life, as one man being bold and fearless in his life. But Paul was human, just like you and I. And uh, he wrote about his fears. Paul described his time in Corinth later by saying in 1 Corinthians 2, 3, I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. So when he is in Corinth, 
There was a point in which we just read about that he was fearful. And we're going to talk about that. He was even trembling as his thoughts of being there in Corinth. And there's a lot of good reasons for his apprehension. Paul had been preaching in the synagogue. He had not preached long before severe Jewish opposition came up against him and rose. Then he turned his attention to the Gentiles, he said. He moved next door to the house of justice. And then Crespus, who was the ruler of the synagogue, again, ain't that awesome? Moved right next to the church and the leader gets right with God. I mean, that's what we need in our churches today. That's what we're going to talk about more too. We need some leaders getting right with God. We need some preachers, some soul winners. We need people, deacons and teachers getting right with God. And being what God was having to be, even the pew warmers. We need you to get right with God. Get right with God. So he moved next door to the synagogue and the leader got right with the Lord. He and his whole family, and many more Corinthians believed in baptized. So Paul was probably sort of rejoicing. And he was in all that the new converts. But at the same time, opposition had caused come up against him. There in that place. You see, this had happened before several times. So this would bo bother this man. It bothers me sometimes because I've been through so many things in my life and I can see things happening and it scares me. You know, because, and you can see Paul. See, the authorities, when he was back in Philippi, he had been beaten and jailed and asked, they asked Paul and Silas both to leave their town. So that's one time. And then he goes from Philippi to Thessalonica where the brethren, the Christian brothers, had sent Paul and Silas away by night because they were fearful for his life for those that were coming after him. Twice now. And then he left Thessalonica and goes to Berea and guess what? The same thing happens again. They start planning his to kill him. So his brethren, the Christians, had to take him away and hide him. And he goes from Berea to Athens. And again, Paul left with mockery ringing in his ears of people around him, mocking him. So now he comes to Corinth. Similar opposition is beginning to build. Paul knew how life threatening, threatening this opposition could be. So Paul has fear. And it's more than of his own safety. He knew the work the Lord was not through there in Corinth. God wasn't through. He wasn't finished. The church was not ready to stand on its own. So perhaps he even wondered if, if he had missed the interpretation of the Macedonian call to be there. But right then at that moment, at that time, of his fear and discouragement, God spoke in Acts 18, 9 and says, Now the Lord spoke to Paul in a night vision, Do not be afraid, but speak, and do not keep silent. Could that be what God is trying to say to us today? There's so many people today fearful. They're fearful of so many things. That's why not people are not church today. So many have become silent. And even before the COVID things, you, we got proof that people are scared or ashamed to witness for their Lord and to live for him because the baptism records of the Baptist and every church denomination have dropped to a low. We haven't been in in 20 years. This was before COVID. And Sunday school attendance had dropped. So you're not the only one, it's everywhere. But that's no excuse for us, is it? I'm going to give you no excuse now this morning. Someone has said the church is like an army. And we talked about that a few weeks ago. How we should march forward in the Lord. And there's a great battle before us. And, but, you know, about the only similarity today between the church and the army is they both eat a lot. Right? Because the church, if we're an army, we're an army of cowards. We backed off. We're not... We're, we found our little corner and we're being silent. We're not speaking out. And that's what God is saying, that we must speak out. See, often the problem is that many are not sure who they are. They seem to be one person in church. But if you see them at school or at work, 
There's a whole different person, a different personality that you don't know. Some people can work at a place for many, many years without anyone suspecting them to be a believer. Shame on you. They should suspect something. You shouldn't be like the world. We're supposed to be salt. We're supposed to be light. We're supposed to speak up and be heard. That people will want what we have. They should see that joy, that peace that we just talked about, that the river has, how it flows in that love. They should see that. They should want that. People got to know who you are. Who are you? Do you know the Lord? And the sooner you clearly identify yourself, the easier witnessing and holy living will be. And that's what it's all about. Yes, we all know we're living in a, a time like none other has ever happened in our lifetime in probably over 200 years. We're experiencing a worldwide pandemic. And on top of that, on top of that, evil that is just exploding all around us and attacking the world as never before. There's an evil sense. I mean, people, I, I'm sorry. Uh, I hardly ever leave the house without my gun. Whether I will use it or not, but I'm scared. I've got that fear of the evil that is around us. And I'm legal. Okay? Let you know that. But it's, this world we're living in, it's like never before. And this evil is attacking the world, but it's, it's attacking through politics and the church. It's working through the church. The evil has come into the churches. The churches are not preaching the word no more. They're not taking a stand against what is evil and what is sin. They're just condoning it to build numbers. That's not right. That's not what God called us to be. He said they're lying. the way to heaven is straight and narrow. It doesn't pull everybody in. But we should be the light that they want to come in. And we should preach the word. Churches have closed because of the power of this thing. They closed down for it. But you know what? Many of them will never reopen the doors again. They won't. Pastors. I, the Baptist press this week has really put some stuff in there. That I really haven't been paying attention to, but you, you may know. And but they've listed so many pastors, leaders, are leaving the pulpit because of all this. Not only leaving the pulpit, they're leaving the faith. They're leaving the church. Pastors, leaders. Now that's going to have a great effect on the church of today. And we're talking about. Massive churches, not just little country churches. Because they're experiencing today persecution from without and from within. And the sheep are scattering as never before. Because the fear of the COVID-19, we are not able to do what we have done in the past. Yes, we know that. Since the church began, we have built churches by doing many things. And I've been a part of how building some churches and, and Lord blessing. And, and y'all can go back and look at my testimonies and the churches I've been. Lord is blessed because we got out and did door-to-door -door visitation. We got out and knocked on doors. We went to wherever. We didn't care if it looked like a drug house or not. I remember one time we and one of the deacons drove up to a place here in Chipley. It's no longer there no more, but... People were out on the porches, big apartment building, and we drove out and opened the doors together, and all of a sudden, everybody was standing looking, and they took off. They thought we were the law already. <laughs> you know that? But we were there, and we, we were able to minister. But, you know, we're door-to-door -door visitation. That's the way we've built the churches, reaching the lost, reaching to them, having big events like eatings and having fellowships and, and bringing people in and having big singings and concerts and events that would draw people, let them know, and, and block parties and, and things. All these things that, that we could just let the church, the community know we're interested in them. Even starting small groups, you know. And, of course, a lot of the churches have been built on the charisma of the pastor, and those are the ones that oh, the charisma is not working no more in this time. 
But all of these things now are frowned upon. They're frowned upon. So we as a church and these guys that always thought they were just in this thing. Apparently they're not called. There's a problem. They're not anointed. And they learned how to build churches because we taught them how. How you can build a church. But now you can't no more. From the way that those people have been down here selling. This is the way you build a church. You can't go by those rules no more. As Paul learned though. We must begin to be glad as a church, as individuals, to identify ourselves. We must stop being afraid. We must speak out and not be silent. And every time I read over this, something kept coming in my mind. And I hope you understand what I'm going to say. But church, we need to start living out loud. He said not to be silent. So what's not being silent? It's being loud, right? So how do we be loud when we can't have our big concerts and we can't have our big gatherings and we can't go to the door? You live it. You live it. You live out loud when you go to the grocery store, when you're out in the public, when you're out among the people, when you're with your family, when you're with your friends, because they're still coming together. We can't do some things, but we can do many more things. We can have outside events. We, we got to get out. We've been saying this for ever since I've been preaching. You got to get outside the church walls and outside the church doors. A lot of churches have put on their doors, you know, leaving to the mission field. Because that's a mission field right outside them doors. We got to go and we got to live it. Live out loud. So Paul, first, he had exhortation from the Lord. And then he got some assurance. And the rest, in Acts 18.10, it says, I am with you and no harm. No one will attack you or hurt you. Now, that's tremendous assurance, isn't it? Here's Paul who has how many cities? Five cities. He doesn't been run out of. And people tried to kill him. But the Lord says, don't worry about it. I am with you. That's what you need to hear. I am with you. For Paul, those words carried enormous meaning. After all, if you read your Bible, it's the same words he spoke to a reluctant Moses. He said the same words to Moses. I will be with you. And to he gave to Gideon, who felt inadequate. Because of who he was. He was not of the right lineage and of the right people. But God called Gideon. But God said to Gideon, I will be with you. He also to Jeremiah. Jeremiah, God spoke to him to go. And he said, but I am but a child. I'm just a child. But God said, I will be with you. The same God who promised to be with them has promised you and I in the great commission in Matthew 28 20 what's it say to us teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you and lo I am with you always even to the end of the age amen like I said Matthew had put that amen on there amen he is with us till the end of the age we're not alone we're not alone. This should be encouragement to believers to be a witness in this hostile world we live in. He is with us, affirming his words in ways both seen and unseen. Now, God gave Paul further insurance in verse 10. And no one will attack you to hurt you. Now, that, that's not to us. That was to Paul. I don't find that nowhere else in the Bible. But to Paul right there for this, for this particular time that he was in Corinth. And we also know that uh, this was not always in the life of Paul. Because actually Paul later wrote to the Corinthians church in 2 Corinthians 11.23 that are there ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more in labors 
more abundant in stripes above measure in prison more frequently in death often from the Jews five times I received 40 stripes minus one so remember this was a promise for Paul at that time in Corinth but we know Paul was persecuted in Paul five times was whipped with a cat of nine tails and other things and he was hurt but yet God was with him. God will be with you no matter what. Please let God's special provision enable him to help you as it enabled Paul to stay in Corinth even after the Jews had started to try to plan to attack him for 18 months. He was able to stay there. Again, there's no special promise that the faithful witness of today will not be harmed. But that's our commission. That's our call. We're not to be silent. We're not supposed to hide. We're not to be afraid. Because no matter where we go. He will be with us. And in our culture. Harm is the exception right now. More than the rule isn't it? Harm is the exception. Um, ordinary. Our greatest danger today. Here in this area. Uh, is ridicule. To be, you know, the persecution is a minimum of a, a little ridicule. People are laughing and ostracizing you maybe, pushing you away from their little groups and, and maybe threats and maybe some harsh words you don't want to hear. That's what's going to come. And we do have that. But even in that type of harassment carries a promise. Did you know that to you? In Matthew 5.11 Jesus said, blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice, he says, and be exceedingly glad when this happens. For great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who went before you. It's always happened. It's always happened. Somebody put, sent me a thing on Facebook or a messenger this week. And it was about somebody talking about the person, how the, so many today are trying to get rid of religion. And he thought I'd get all upset. I said, they've been trying to get rid of religion for 6,000 years, since the beginning of time. There's been the battle. It's going to happen. Satan's fighting. Paul also, though, would you see this? He got words of encouragement. In Acts 18.10, God said, I have much people in this city. What a remarkable promise that was. Now, he didn't say they were all saved yet. He didn't say. He said, but I've got a lot of people here. There's a lot of potential here. There's a lot of opportunity here. You're not alone. You're not alone. You see, it's very remarkable when you know the nature of the city of Corinth he was in. Corinth was a prominent commercial metropolitan crossroads on uh, a land between what we call the northern and southern Greece. And everybody that was a trader, they had to get, they was going north and south or south and north, they had to come through Corinth. And most of them going east and west come through Corinth. It was sort of like today if you fly anywhere, you're going to go through Atlanta. Okay? And different, we always got to go through Atlanta. Always got to go through Atlanta. You know, or, and if you're up north, you've got to go through Chicago. Every time you're going to land in Chicago, that's what Corinth was. It was a big commercial metropolitan city. And a lot of people who had traveled through there decided, hey, this is a good place. I'm going to come back. And they brought all kind of cultures with them and all these beliefs together. There was even the, uh, I can't say, the worship of the goddess Aphrodite, the uh, Archcothor. There, behind the city, house. This was a religious place. House thousands of prostitutes, who were essential participants in the worship of the fertility goddess. The very name Corinth became synonymous with sensuality, with lust, with parties, with drunkenness. That's what the city was all about. It was a large city. It was a city. That God said, though, I have many people here. Here's this evil city. But God says, I have many people there. And Paul mentions this in the other books. And actually, 
Tradition has it that Corinth was one of Paul's largest churches that he established. And some of Paul's greatest friendships and supports eventually came out of Corinth. Priscilla and Aquila and many others. Priscilla and Aquila even shaved his head because he made a vow. You see, the point is, if God had many people in that city, that wicked city, a city whose very name is synonymous with perversion and corruption, then surely God has many people in Washington County, Holmes County, Jackson County. Don't you think? Don't you think God's got many people around us and many people who, some of them work where you do, some of them go to school where you go to school, they live in your community, they're here. We can still meet them. We can still have that acquaintance. We may not be able to hug and we may not be able to sit down in large groups anymore, but we they're here. And what remains for us is to do is stop being silent. We must speak out. Some of you haven't even told you. They know you go to church, but have you ever asked them if they know the Lord Jesus Christ? They come and visit you, grandkids, cousins, relatives. Y'all see each other, but I don't, they're not here. And a lot of them are not nowhere. They're waiting for somebody to love them, to care. We must keep speaking. We must live out loud and, and draw on the strength of God's presence in our lives. Our, our witness must be forward and clear. For only then can God use us to be a witness, to lead them to Christ. John Wesley, he was one of those that believed in living out loud. And he would find the worst part in the town where he was at. He would go find the worst part in the town. And he would stand on the sidewalks and he would begin to sing the 100th Psalm. Sing the, I'm not going to sing it. I tried to learn it, but I can't do it. It's a, make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. Listen to that. Serve the Lord with gladness, he would sing. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us and now not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name for the Lord is good. All the time, right? His mercy is everlasting. And his truth endures to all generations. And he would sing that. And people would listen. And as they listened, he would eventually say, All right, I'm going to come back here in a little bit. I'm going to preach. So y'all be here. We're going to preach the word. Because he'd say, Surely this place is right for him. It's right for him to call the right, not the righteous, but the sinners to repentance. And that's what made John Wesley great. He was never a coward. He lived his life out loud. No, he, even in the evil times that he lived in. We can do the same with God's strength today, people. We must trust God, use ever available avenue, and hold the banner high. We must get off the fence and quit making excuses. Well, we're living in a difficult time. We're living in a wicked time. Yes, we are. But is it any different than it has been in reality? Get out in the open. Get out in the open. Not be silent, but live out loud. Paul received the words of encouragement and assurance in his time. He said in Acts 18, 9, do not be afraid, but speak. Do not keep silent, for I am with you, and no one will attack you to hurt you, for I have many in this city. As God speaks his word today, in these difficult times we live in, can you hear him maybe saying to you today, don't be afraid. Stop being afraid. Start living out loud. Don't be silent no more. Live out loud. Because, yes, there's some of them. You may be living right next door. 
to somebody like Paul moved to the leader of the synagogue. Oh, they may be religious people, but they don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. But they need to see. They may be the worst person in the community and they may be the most righteous person in the community. But if they don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, heaven is not their home and they don't have the hope and peace that you have. That's why we've got to live it before them every day. That's why the Bible teaches us that we've got to be salt. We've got to make them thirsty for what we have. And then we've got to be that light. Let his light shine through us that takes them out of that darkness and leads them to him. Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Are you willing today to live out loud? Would you stand with us this morning and allow the Lord to speak to you and stand together? Lord, we come at this time and we thank you for each one that is here. And Lord, we know there's some here that may be lost and they may not know you as their Lord and Savior. And we pray, Lord, that right now, Lord, you will call them, Lord, and they'll receive Lord, what they're missing. They may be living in fear of the wickedness that is around them and, and of the future and what it holds. But Lord, there's assurance in you that they can have life and have it more abundantly if they just repent of their sins and come before you and present themselves to be your servants. Lord, I pray that you'd give them the courage this morning to come. And Lord, if there's some here in this church, Lord, we haven't been living as we should. We've let the world scare us to death and back us down and silence our voices. Lord, I pray that you would help us today to take that assurance, Lord, that you've given us and the encouragement you have given us, Lord, and that we'll come and say, yes, Lord. Help me every day to find someone, a path that you would lead us on, that we can live before others, that they will see Christ in us, and you will be glorified. Lord, have your way right now. As June plays the piano, would you join?